Good morning and uh, welcome to worship this morning. Thank the band for their introduction. Uh, Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us should be our prayer this morning. Just remind you of some diary events. Uh, on Wednesday we have our cafe and in the evening we have Bible study. On Thursday we have the Macmillan Coffee Morning. I would ask you to consider supporting that if you haven't already done so. Our doors will be open at 9 and uh, serving the public between 11 and 2. If you can't be there and you would like to make a financial donation, sitting right above Philip's head at the moment, there's a little QR code. Uh, feel free to scan it and it will take you to the, the Macmillan Just Giving page and uh, you, can, uh, you can make a donation via your mobile phone and that would be very much appreciated, I'm sure. Thank you to those who have promised baking, and uh, you're still welcome to offer if you haven't already done so. Uh, in order to get that baking to the hall, the hall will be open on Wednesday between 9 and 8 in the evening, 9 o'clock in the morning to 8 in the evening, and uh, on Thursday morning, as I say, we're open from 9 o'clock, and you're very welcome to come along and drop your baking in. Then on Friday, we have Kids Zone, and we have Band. In relation to our forthcoming core anniversary, please continue to promote and encourage attendance, especially from those who perhaps used to attend here at the core, uh, and for whatever reason, perhaps they've moved away or just grown a bit cold uh, and not wanting to be here for the time being. Please uh, get in touch, uh, as some of you have already done, and encourage them to come along that weekend. The dinner numbers are currently sitting in the mid-50s, and we need to finalise those numbers by mid-October. Uh, there is a sign-up sheet still in the YP Hall and there is an online form that you can access via our Facebook page when you look at the advert for the core anniversary weekend. We are happy to organise transport for those who would otherwise find it difficult to be here. Some of that has already taken place and if you would like to, are, are able to volunteer as a driver for that, please speak to me and we'll put you on the, the list for that particular evening. And finally, uh, before we welcome Stephen to, to lead us in our worship this morning, uh, I'm very grateful, Stephen, for your participation and your willingness to do it. Uh, can I remind you that we, as a court, will go into winter uniform, as is the norm, from the 1st of October. So that will be next Sunday. Thanks very much. Good morning. Um, I'm not going to mention last night's rugby. But as the rugby match was being played, I was constantly being text messaged all the way through it from Major Peter, who obviously likes his rugby as well. He was supporting the other team. Um, but he, he, he was, when he was texting me, he was texting me about the rugby, but he also was saying that they were praying for this morning's worship. And so, um, so here we are. We're here, we're here to worship, and we're going to start, commence a meeting with singing the song Will you come and follow me? Uh, and we're just, it's five verses, and if you'd like to stand and follow the band, please.
Let us open in prayer. Lord, today we call your faithfulness. Thank you that you walk with us every day, that you are with us always. We proclaim that your promises are true and your goodness and love never fail. In this moment, we come to you and lay our lives before you. May we honor, worship, and adore you with every fiber of our being. Father, we proclaim that you are the Holy One, the Lord God Almighty, who was, who was and is and is to come. Your beauty and majesty are beyond compare. On this day, we join with all those who worship and confess you as Lord, from generations past and present, and with all the angels that sing in heaven of your greatness and splendor. Lord, we adore you. Lord, we love you. Lord, we bow down and worship you. Amen. This began 29 years ago. Uh, I first came to Scotland as a student, and I was more or less buying on this weekend. It was the September bank holiday weekend. And uh, when my mum and dad dropped me off, my dad wrote in my Bible. And in the Bible, he wrote these, these words uh, just at the front. It's actually dated the 25th of the 9th, 1994. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Proverbs 3, verse 6. See, I am sending an angel ahead of you to guard you along the way and to bring you to the place I have prepared. Exodus chapter 23, verse 20. And I just thought this morning it'd be nice to kind of share together. So this is actually an invitation for everybody to share your favorite Bible verse. Um, because there's so much wisdom in this book. And uh, we often do testimonies, but sometimes we don't do what I think it was used to be called gospel shots. So this morning we're going to kind of do a wee kind of gospel shots. So I've given you two gospel shots to start off with. And uh, what I you do is, um, if you'd like to say a, a verse of scripture of, of your preference, you put your hand up and uh, Philip, Philip's got a microphone. It's useful as a microphone for those who are in the loop. Okay, um, so over to yourselves. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thank you, Ian. You may. Philippians 4 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transforms all. Sorry. The peace of God, which transcends all understanding will keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Dorothy. Jesus said, I will be with you to the end of the age. Thank you, Mary. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take and stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Thank you, Ian. Time for one more. Romans 8, 35 to 40, there is hope in Jesus Christ. 
Thank you very much. Thank you for your, for your contributions. And we will now hand over to the ensemble. everybody okay nice to see some smiley faces so let me bring on some more smiles for you what if I told you today that uh, the king of Great Britain is going to be in our midst in exactly 10 minutes would you believe me no impossible <laughs> why would you not believe me any reasons he's just on his way it depends yeah the reason is because you see that there's no preparation for him to be here this morning, is it? There's no red carpets, there's no uh, dressed up police officers with their fancy hats. <laughs> we don't have any information, prior information at all. And nextly, you're wondering why would he come to Clyde Bank Salvation Army overall, right? So, but this morning, if I told you the King of Kings is in our midst, would you believe me now? Now, whether you believe me or not, but the Bible says when two or three are gathered in his name, in Matthew 18, he says, there am I. So the king who rules this world, who rules each one of us, is with, it, with us this morning. But the saddest thing is, we fail to believe that. So if you believe that statement, sing with us as we sing, King of Kings, Majesty. You can stand and sing if you like to stand and worship, or you can sit down and worship the Lord with us.
Thank you for singing so well. I'm going to sing one more song just now, um, and it's uh, a song by Michael W. Smith. Um, I don't really know when he released it, back in the 90s, I think, and it's called You Are Holy Prince of Peace. Um, the reason that we've chosen this one is because in the whole opening verse says, You are holy, you are mighty, you are worthy of praise, I will follow, I will listen, I will love you all of my days. Because he is holy, because he is mighty, because we will worship, we will follow. It requires a response from us. Um, this song, if you're not familiar with it, is nice and straightforward because it's a bit of call and response at the beginning. So I'll sing the first line and then you repeat it straight after me uh, and for the verse. So we'll just sing the verse through just now so that you know how that bit goes and then I'll stop and I'll teach you the chorus bit. So the verse goes like this. You are holy. Now the chorus splits in two. Can we go on to the next slide, please, boys? Thank you very much. Okay, so we're going to split into two groups. Um, if you like singing, well, you can choose whether you like singing low or high, to be honest, because you can sing this down the octave or up the octave. Um, so the yellow bit, which is kind of green on that screen, but the yellow bit at the top, <laughs> thank you, um, it goes like this. If I can get the notes. Ready? It goes on two, three. I will sing to and worship the King who is worthy and I will love and next slide adore you and I will bow down before him and I will sing to and worship the King who is worthy and I will love and adore down the octave or up the octave. Can we all try and sing that bit just now? The yellow bit. Can we go back to the beginning of those ones? Thank you. That one, there we go. <laughs> so let's try and sing the chorus together. Here we go. I will sing to and worship the King who is worthy. Are going to sing with me and we're going to do the blue bit 
of the stall. So you've got the more word to write, okay? And then if you are on that side of the hall, you guys are going to do the yellow bit. You can choose if you want to sing it high or low, it's up to you, okay? But you guys are going to sing the yellow bit. Everyone in the band know what side they're on? Yes? Good, okay. Fabulous. <laughs> so let's go back to the very beginning and see if we can sing this the whole way through. And I'm going to invite you to stand. And let's enjoy singing this song together. Okay, I wonder if the young folk could come down. This is a spot for you. Well, we've got one anyway. <laughs> you may get something at the end. I know that would get us a rush. Okay, I'm going to tell you a story today, and it's a story about an elephant. And apologies for all you oldies, I think I've heard it before. Okay, it's a story about an elephant. Okay, oh, they're coming more and more, that's great. This elephant was called Wilbur. And Wilbur lived in a zoo, but he wasn't kept in his enclosure all the time because he had a very special job to do. 
He used to take the children on his back and his keeper would take them around the zoo and show them all the animals, explain what they were. But Wilbur felt a bit sad. He thought, every day I take the children on my back and I walk all around the zoo and nobody bothers about me. It's all about the lions and the tigers and everything. But nobody really thinks about me. Well, one night, when everybody had uh, gone home, um, the, all the animals were in their enclosures. They found themselves in the enclosure. And uh, Wilbur found himself actually out walking in the zoo and walking around. And he got to the first enclosure and he looked over the fence and thought, Who are you? And the animal said, I'm a camel. Look, magic. We're on track here. He says, I'm a camel. And he looked at him and says, you're a kind of strange looking animal. What's that big hump in your back? And he says, that's because I can store water. I may be in the desert for days and days and never get it. I can store water and I don't need to drink. He says, that's fantastic. That's really good. That'd be really handy for me because when I'm wandering around the zoo, I don't know where I'm going to get stop and get a drink. I wish I had one of them. So, he felt his back getting a bit itchy. And when he looked round, he saw there was a hump in his back, the same as the camels. All right. And he thought, well, that doesn't really make me an elephant. He became a cam elephant. Okay. And he thought, that's great. I can carry water around with me all day. He says, I'll go around and I'll show the other animals. So he went off to the next enclosure and he looked over the fence and someone passed him in a hurry and thought, well, I'm in here, what was that? So he says, come here. So the animal came over and said, how come you were so fast there? What are you anyway? He says, well, I'm an antelope. He says, and how come you can run so fast? He says, well, these legs might look quite slim, but they're really powerful and I can leap and I can move really, really fast. Well, Wilbur thought, Phew, I wish I could get legs like that because if I could get around the zoo as quickly as that, I could carry far more children. <coughs> so, his he felt his legs getting a bit itchy and he thought, oh, what's going on here? And when he looked down, there were the thinnest legs and the strongest legs he had ever seen. Great, he says, I can move quickly, but that makes me... A camelly fanty lope. That's easy for you to say. Well, Wilbur was so pleased with himself, he decided, I'm going to charge up and show all the animals. He got to the far end of the zoo, and he looked around, and just as he turned, he looked around, he said, oh, you're strange-looking birds. Who are you? And the bird says, well, I'm a pelican. He goes, what's that pouch under your beak for? He says, well, it means I can pick up food. And it means then, whenever I'm hungry, I've already got the food to eat. He goes, wow, that would be fantastic, that would be, I wish it that, drink and food. He says, that would be actually really good. And then he felt his, under his tongue getting quite itchy. And he thought, oh, so he sneezed. And all of a sudden, when he looked down, there was a pouch. Okay. And he thought, that's great. That makes me a camelli fantalo pelican. <laughs> I've had to practice these, you know that. <laughs> oh, it gets better. Okay, and he says, it's fantastic. I can run as fast as I can. I've got plenty to eat, plenty to drink. Life just doesn't get any better, does it? So, he coming back through the zoo, showing off everything to the other uh, animals. And he passed the birdhouse and he heard the most beautiful song. A wonderful song. He said, who's that that's singing? And he said, it's me. And what are you? He says, I'm a canary. He says, wow, I wish I could sing like that. And when he, when he turned around and he went to speak, he felt his throat getting a bit itchy. And he thought, oh, what's happening here? And he went to trumpet as elephants do. And out came the most beautiful song. A beautiful song. And he says, oh, that's great. That makes me a camelli fantalo pelicanary. <laughs> Get through it. That's really good. And he thought, that's fantastic. 
everybody will love me. I'm unique. There's nothing like me at all. It's absolutely brilliant. And I can sing to the children. I've got plenty of water, plenty of food. Life is just perfect. So when he came to the morning, he thought, that is absolutely brilliant. He rushed as quick as he could down to the, the gate. And he's leaning against the wall, quite chuffed to himself, singing away quite a thing. Then the doors opened. And in came the children and the adult. And the children looked at him and thought, what on earth is that? And I'm not going to say it again. He said, what on earth is that? And they all laughed and laughed and laughed at him. And poor Wilbur got himself really upset. He thought, James, I thought it was perfect because I could do all these things and I looked like all the other animals. And lo and behold, Everybody just laughs at me. So he went away back to his bed. And he got into his bed. He pulled the covers over his head as we do when we're a bit fed up and embarrassed. And he was there. And I just seemed to have got to sleep when there was a noise. And the keepers were in saying, right, everybody up. Come on, let's get going. We've got jobs to do and all the rest of it. And Wilbur looked down at his legs and thought, oh, my legs are elephant legs. He says, oh, I've not got a hump on my back. That's really good. And I don't have anything under my trunk. That's great. He says, and he went to sing, and he trumpeted like an elephant should. And he thought, that is absolutely fantastic. And you know, sometimes we like that when we're at school, or we're at play school, or we go out with our friends, think, wow, they're really good at that. I wish I looked like that. I wish I could do that. But you know, God has made each one of us an individual. And he has a plan for each one of us. And all we have to do is trust him because he will give us everything that we need to fulfill his plan. We just need to trust him and follow him. So I hope you've learned something of that story. If not, I can't do anything about it. But anyway... I'll leave that with you. I saw these in the shop the other day and I thought, this is perfect. They're animal chocolate biscuits. So you can make sure everybody gets one. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. <laughs> Offering. Thank you. Let us pray. Lord, you are an abundant God, and out of your great mercy you have given us so much. We give you this offering today. With it we worship you and give our whole selves to you. Please now take it and use it for the, your kingdom and your glory. Amen.
If you wish to follow this morning's Bible reading, there are two, two uh, passages of Scripture I'm going to be using today. The first one is going to be Ma- uh, sorry, John chapter 1, and the second will be Matthew chapter 4. So Matthew chapter 1, verse, verses 35 to 42. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning round, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying and spent that day with him. It was about the tenth hour. Andrew, Simon's brothers, Simon's, Simon and Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is, the Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which, means, which translated is Peter. And now we're going to go back to Matthew, Matthew chapter 4. And I'm reading verse 18 to 20. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. Just now we're going to have a contribution from the band uh, as our form of worship.
I'd like to thank uh, Graham for his story earlier for the, the young people about Wilbur the elephant, or I can't actually say the longer name, so I'm not going to try. Um, and obviously there's a message in that story, but I'd like to kind of to, to go a bit further with the message. And I'm going to ask you the question this morning, at the, at the very start of our thoughts, are you who God intends you to be? Are you who God intends you to be? Now, I'm not talking about your occupation. I'm not talking about what you do daily, whatever. I'm talking about who you are, your identity, who you are as a person inside, how you think, what you believe, how you behave, how you act, and how you treat others. Are you who God intends you to be? Now, I'm not going to ask you to answer that question yourselves just right now, but I'd like you to think about that question as we kind of look at the passage of Scripture today. And uh, this, the two passages of Scripture I brought to you were about two brothers and their encounter with Jesus. So the, first, the second reading I brought to you was Matthew chapter 4, and I'm just going to read that again because it's not that long, to be honest. So, as Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew, they were casting a net into the lake, and they, they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. Now, if you read the Bible from the beginning to the very, very end, this is the first time you will hear of Andrew and Simon Peter. I'm going to call him Peter from now on because it's confusing to keep saying Simon Peter. So this is the first time you come across Andrew and Peter. And it's, if you read this for the first time, you get to think to yourself, here's Jesus just walking along the Sea of Galilee, da 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 da, thinking to themselves, you know what, I could do this kind of getting a wee gang together. You know, get some disciples, oh, there's two fishermen, I'll just ask two random fishermen, they're just going to give up, their fishermen, be fishermen, give up being fishermen and come follow me. And of course, he says, follow me and I will make you fishermen. And the two fishermen just went, okay. And off they went. It all seems a bit random. And uh, that's the problem. If you read the Bible from beginning to the end, it can look that. But actually, if you look at the Gospels, the Gospels aren't necessarily in chronological order. It's all different stories. And you hear diff different books will have different stories. And actually, if you go further on the Bible, you can go back in time. Because if you go then to... Uh, sorry, if you, then go, if you then go to John chapter 1, you find out that this, is in the, this occasion on the Sea of Galilee when Jesus walks by these two fishermen isn't actually the first time he meets them. They actually met a period before that. And we read how in John chapter 1, John, John chapter 1 is actually about John the Baptist. Now John the Baptist, had his, he, his job was to kind of pave the way for the coming of Jesus, to help prepare people for the coming of Jesus. And John the Baptist also had his own disciples. And it tells you in John chapter 1 that Andrew, one of the fishermen, is actually a disciple of John the Baptist. I'm just going to flick on to John chapter 1 here. Yep. It says... The next day, John was there with two of his disciples. And later on, it says, Andrew was one of the two who heard what John had said. Andrew, as a follower and a disciple of John the Baptist, was getting prepared for the coming of the Messiah. He was, when, when, and then obviously when John saw Jesus, he says, look, there is the Lamb of God. Andrew was prepared he was desperate and certain for the Messiah. And what's the first thing Andrew does? Andrew runs away and go gets his brother Peter to bring him to Jesus. So Peter too is also desperate in trying to find the Messiah. So here you have two brothers who are hungry in the pursuit of of Jesus and the Messiah. Jesus 
knows about this. So obviously when he meets them again, he's already met them, he spent time with them, and he knows that these two brothers are hungry to be followers of him. And he then calls him to them, the two brothers to become followers of him. So when I think of this pursuit, I suppose I can ask the question, what about your own pursuit of Jesus? How hungry are you in pursuing Jesus? I, I recently heard uh, a wee illustration. Imagine Jesus being the son. And we have Christians, or churchgoers, being like planets orbiting around the sun. The danger is, is that you could be orbiting around Jesus, and you could be moving. And you could think you're doing great things, but you may be moving, but relative to Jesus, you are moving no closer. And one of the problems of being a person orbiting around Jesus, is that you may see other churchgoers and other Christians who are orbiting as well, but they're further away. They're still orbiting too. And when you see them and you think to yourself, well, they're further away than I am, so I'm doing all right, so I feel good about myself. But the truth is, if you're not in pursuit of Jesus, you're no better than somebody who's orbiting around and you're getting no closer to him. If you're orbiting around Jesus, it's time you de-orbit. It's time you, you turn your attention to Jesus and continue your pursuit of him. When I also look at the word follow, come follow me, Jesus said, and I think of the word follow, one of the thoughts that came to my mind was following a trend, you know, stylish haircuts or fashion, trend in fashion, or trend in interior design. And if you're a follower of a trend, then you also want to be up to date with that trend. So you, you want to have the haircut that's relevant to the trend, or you want to wear the clothes that are relevant to what the trend is, and so on and so on. You don't want to be behind the trend, you want to be with the trend. And my thought on that was, when Jesus said, come and follow me, it wasn't just a case of following, it's, it's a case of being like him, being Christ-like. And to be Christ-like means to kind of walk the same paths and go the same way as Jesus goes. So with that in mind, I thought, okay, well, if, if we go the same way as Jesus, what kind of ways of Jesus are there. So this morning I've got three examples of ways of Jesus. The first one is Matthew chapter 5, and it's from the Sermon on the Mount. Love your enemies. Jesus says, You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. That's not easy to do, is it? You see, this summer, uh, Fiona and myself and the girls went to Paris. And uh, I don't know if you've been to Paris before. Uh, but Paris is an absolutely stunning, beautiful city. But as a city, it's actually a medieval city. And if you know what a medieval city is, medieval cities tend to be narrow streets, curves, and all that kind of thing. Uh, but way back in the mid-19th century, Napoleon asked a man called George Hausman to update the city. And, and what Hausman did was he created what they called the Hausmanian Plan. And he cut new streets into the city of Paris. And now when you go there, there's this whole juxtaposition of the old medieval city with all these big new avenues and boulevards and monuments and all this kind of stuff kind of laid over the top of it. And I wonder as well this morning, Jesus basically took 
the way the world does things and cut new paths into it. And these new paths are harder to take than the way the world wants us to go. So when the world says, don't get mad, get, get even, Jesus says, no, love your enemy, pray for those who persecute you. That's a harder path to take, and it's easier just to stick to the medieval roots. Enemies can come in all shapes and forms. Some who are could be just rude to you. Some could talk behind you, talk about you behind your back. Some will just want you to fail. Sometimes the enemy could just be somebody who's just always complains all the time, has a negative attitude all the time, and just brings you down. And so it's easier sometimes just to not like them, to, to hate them, to wish something bad on them. But no, God says, Jesus says, love them and pray for them. You see, it's, it's, if, you, if you turn over the pearly, pearly gates of heaven and you say, you know, St. Peter, I loved all the people who loved me. Jesus was, Peter would say, well, that's not hard to do. Anybody can love anybody who loves you. The hard bit is loving people who don't love you. That's the challenge. And that is one of the paths that Jesus wants us to take. The second one I would like to, the second way of Jesus I'd like to kind of bring to your attention this morning is serving others. And my thought on that one was Mark chapter 10. It's the Last Supper. The disciples have spent all this time with Jesus. They've been learning from Jesus, but yet they fall into the trap of power struggle. They start to argue with themselves, who's the greatest? I want to sit next to you on your right-hand side when I get to the kingdom of heaven. So James and John are the two who start this. But the rest of the disciples, to be honest, weren't that far behind. And they were quickly, whoa, 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 what about us kind of thing. But Jesus was very much a case of, hey, no, that's not how it is. That's not how it is at all. He says, even the, the leaders of the Gentiles lord over them, he says. But that will not be you. Jesus then tells them, If you want to be great in the kingdom of heaven, you've got to serve others. Even the Son of God, he says, as he talks about himself, came to earth to serve others. I don't think anybody, anybody here would argue with me in the sense if I said that probably the, the greatest person to ever walk on the, place, on the planet Earth is Jesus, the most powerful person. He was God in flesh. If anybody who ever lived on this Earth deserved to have a throne built on Earth with a big, huge castle around him and have everybody just worship him, it was Jesus. But Jesus didn't do that. Jesus came as a servant king and he came to lay down his lives for all who believe in him. And Jesus tells them, you have to serve others. And Jesus led by example on that matter. So that is another way of Jesus. Put others before ourselves. You know, there is nothing that can destroy a congregation of any church than a power struggle. I've seen it happen in other cores. I've seen it, heard it in other churches where you've got one person who is in a position of power and abuses it, 
and other people who wish they had power and try and knock the person down. Nothing destroys churches like a power struggle. It's something we have to remember. And always remember, Jesus said, and I'm going to say it again, serve others. Do not pretend you're the greatest. The last way of Jesus I'm going to bring to you this morning, and to be honest, there are more than these, these three ways that I brought today, this morning, but the last one is love the marginalized. The story I'm thinking of here is the John chapter 4, where Jesus is traveling with his disciples through some, Somalia. Is that how you say it? Samar- Samaria, sorry, Samaria. And uh, they're tired so, and they're hungry, so Jesus sends the disciples off to get some food, and he waits at the well. It's noon, middle of the afternoon, and a woman approaches the well. Now, Jesus is a, a rabbi, in a sense of the word. Um, and no rab- rabbi would ever be seen alone with a woman. So here Jesus risks his reputation by staying at the well as this woman approaches. So we have what we call a, a gender issue here. But then this woman is Samaritan. And obviously Jesus is king of the Jews. And Jews and Samaritans don't mix. Jesus stays, despite the fact that there's, you could say that there is a, an ethnic issue But the reason why the, the, the woman was there at the well at noon, at the hottest time of the day, is because that's a time of day when no, nobody else would, would normally be there. All the other women would come in the evening, and it would be more like a social gathering as they come to the well and collect their water. So this woman was there at noontime because she was not accepted. And Jesus also says to her, I know you've had many wives, and he knows she's an adulterer. So we have a moral issue here as well. So we've got a gender issue, ethnic issue, and a moral issue. But yet Jesus stays and talks to this lady and gives her exactly what she needs. Jesus was looking out for the marginalized. And I suppose this morning that is a way of Jesus, is to, to look out for the marginalized. It's very easy to just push them to the side. Most people who are on the marginalized tend to stay in the periphery as it is. They don't tend to be at the forefront a lot of things. So quite often you have to look out for them. And these are the people who need to be shown love and the love of Jesus. So again, this is another way of Jesus. And as I said before, these ways are not easy ways to take. It is so much easier if we just stick to the paths that Society tells us it's easier to take. But if you want to be a follower of Jesus, and if you want to be Christ-like, these are the kind of paths that we need to look at and be willing to take. So if this is what following Christ requires of us, what is our response Andrew and Peter, their response was immediate. They left their nets and followed Jesus. Have you ever wondered what would happen if they didn't leave their nets? Instead, they dragged their nets with them. Could you imagine these two disciples following around with Jesus, dragging these big nets around with them? Just picture that, for example. They're probably not these wee light kind of material nets that we have today. These these, these are heavy ropes. This is heavy, heavy nets. There is no way these two men could have followed Jesus and dragged these nets around with them. They had to leave their nets behind. And I just wonder this morning if those nets could be a metaphor for ourselves. Do we have nets in our lives that are holding us back from following Jesus? Is there anything that we're holding on to that we need to let go? 
to follow Jesus and to be who God intends us to be, we have to be prepared to drop those nets. So what I'd like to do just now is I'd like you to put your hands out in front of you. And I want you to clench. And I want you to imagine there's a net in your hand. And what is that net to you? Now, this is a personal question. This is, a, this is something for you to think about. Are you holding on to a net which is holding you back from following Christ? Is there something that's dragging you? And the invitation I want to do just now, uh, David's going to play a, ch- a chorus, a tune, a song, sorry, and the words are going to come up on the screen. And after he's played through the first time, as he goes the second time through, I invite you to turn your hands around and drop those nets. Drop whatever it is that's holding you back. The truth is, if you can't drop them, please don't sing. If you want to let go of them, but you struggle to, the place of worship here, the the place of prayer is right here. And I invite you to be able to come down and pray here. Father, thank you for all the marvellous things you've done today. 
Thank you for your love that you have revealed to us and for the love that we share together as your body. We pray for all the words that you have shown, sown into our hearts this day. Watch over them, protect them. May they take root and produce wonderful things, things of beauty and great blessings to many. And as we approach the end of this meeting, thank you that you walk with us. May we be alert to your promptings and live in your endless love. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory, in this age and forevermore. Amen. Well, obviously thinking of paths and following and walking, I thought well, nothing better than a good walking tune, or marching tune as we would call it back home. Uh, it's one you will know, valiant soldier marching to the fray, keep in step all the time. And I invite you to stand as we sing our closing hymn. for the benediction. O Father, let thy love remain. O Son, may I, like, may I the like 
may I thy likeness gain. O Spirit, stay to comfort me. O triune God, praise be to thee. Amen.